Okay, let's talk time dilation. Uh, first off, the word dilation means to stretch. And uh, typically when um, t talking about time dilation, the starting point is a story involving two people. One of those people is going to be you, and one of those people is going to be me, so that we can keep track of who's doing what. So if I start with your story, your story, traditionally, is told with you inside a train carriage. So here is the train carriage that is currently passing a station. So let me draw the station platform. You are on the train, so this is you, and I am on the platform, so that is me. Your train is moving, in this case to the right, with a velocity v. And if we set up the basic idea with the example of a tennis ball, you are bouncing a tennis ball up and down, and you are bouncing it on the floor. It goes straight up and straight back down, and then lands at exactly the same point where it was bounced in the first place from your perspective. But because your train is passing by the station, from my perspective, I see the ball bounce on the floor the first time here. The train moves along, and then the ball is near the ceiling, and then the train moves along, and then the ball lands on the floor again. So what I see is kind of like a, a not straight up, straight down pattern for the ball. I see it doing a, an arc as it passes by in the train. You see straight up, straight down. And it's that contrasting viewpoint that we're going to be exploring. So if we now set up the experiment to be a little bit more relativistic, we're going to um, be having a good look at the second postulate of relativity now, and that is that the speed of light is measured to be the same in all frames of reference, all inertial frames of reference. So you're inertial because you're travelling at constant velocity, and I'm inertial because I'm travelling at constant velocity as well. Okay, so let's uh, fancy up the story a little bit. Let's dig a recess into the floor of the train uh, where we will have a laser source and detector. And let's dig a recess into the ceiling of the train where we will have a reflective mirror. You will be observing the event of a laser beam being fired straight up to the ceiling where it will strike the mirror and then return right back along the path that it came to be detected. And you are going to measure that time interval using a stopwatch and we'll call that time delta t. Another thing that we will be interested in is the height of the train carriage from floor to ceiling which we'll just call h. Okay so event one is the start point of the laser beam, event two is the detection of the laser beam. So that same story from my perspective now, so I need to draw your train carriage ceiling and the train carriage floor, both of which will be moving with a velocity v. And when the story starts with the laser beam being emitted, the mirror was directly above the uh, laser source, but as the train moves, the mirror moves with it, and so we, I'm seeing a sort of diagonal path for the laser beam. It then strikes the mirror, and at that point the uh, detector is directly below, but because the uh, train is moving along, by the time the laser beam ends up back where it started, the train has moved along such that event 1, which is the emission of the laser beam, and event 2, the detection of the laser beam, are not happening in the same place. So, going back to me on the platform, I also have a stopwatch. I'm also going to be measuring that time interval between those two events. And the height of the train is going to be the same age for me. Okay, so let's go back 
to your picture and my picture together. We've both got stopwatches and we're both measuring the time it takes between event one and event two. Event one is the emission of the laser beam, event two is the detection of the laser beam. And because the lesson is called time dilation, we know that these two time intervals are not going to be the same. So we need to separate one from the other by using some subscript notation. So I'm going to be putting a subscript zero on one of these uh, time intervals. And I'm going to be choosing you to have the subscript zero because you are going to be observing something that is called proper time. And proper time is assigned to the time difference between events one and two if those events happen in the same place. So because from your perspective, event one, the emission of the laser beam, and event two, the detection of the laser beam, happen at exactly the same place, you are observing something known as proper time, so you get the subscript zero. For me, event one and event two are not happening in the same place, so I am not observing proper time, so I do not deserve the subscript zero there. So when you see the sub subscript zero, that's what that means. That is referencing something known as proper time. So let's start doing some maths now. Let's start with the easy maths, and I'll use a different colored pens to try and keep track of what we're doing. Now, let's start with your story, you, uh, and we're going to apply a simple speed equals distance divided by time uh, high school equation here. The speed in question is that of a laser beam, so that's going to be the speed of light C. The distance travelled in our picture is from the floor to the ceiling, which is H, and then from the ceiling back to the floor again, which is 2H. And then I'm going to divide that by how long you observe that taking, which is proper time delta T zero. Now to facilitate some ease later on I would like to be substituting this equation in from your story into my story and I'll be doing that via the fact that the height of the train in your story and the height of the train in my story is the same. So if I rearrange this equation to make H the subject we have C times by proper time delta T zero and then divided by two, but I'm just gonna write that as a, a half C delta T zero. Okay, so far so good with regards to the maths. Now, let's go back to my story. What am I seeing? Well, I, first of all, I'm seeing a completely different uh, distance here. This is not straight up, straight down, so I need to give this a, a different letter to H. I'll call it L, so we're going L up and L down. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm seeing my distance equals speed time speed uh, my speed equals distance divided by time as uh, as the following. So the speed is still going to be that of the speed of light. So I'll put c equals and it goes diagonal length l diagonal length l. So that's two l and I'm dividing it by uh, the time interval that I measure, but it's not proper time. So delta t. Now I would like to get rid of L and substitute it in with something that has an H in it instead. So let's have a closer look at uh, this journey here. The time between these two points, the time interval between these two points and the velocity of the train allows me to calculate the distance between these two points. And that distance would be speed times time, distance equals speed times time, and so the distance here would just be the speed of the train times the time interval, which I'm measuring as delta t. That means if I was to start drawing a right angle triangle now, I can now, if I sort of copy that out here, start linking the lengths h, the height of the train, the diagonal length l, to this distance here, which is going to be half of this distance, so I'll put a half v delta t. That means if I want to link all these sides together, it would be via l squared equals a half v, t, uh, v delta t. 
squared. Come on, nearly made an error there. Plus h squared. So that means, I know it seems silly, but I'm going to put all the steps in. L is going to be the square root of a half v delta t squared plus h squared. So far, so good. So let's put this expression in instead of L over here. So I end up with C equals two times. So now I'm going to copy and paste all of this. Let's see if I can get that all on the camera at the same time. So two times instead of L, I'm going to be putting the square root of a half V delta T squared plus H squared all over delta T. Great. Now it's here where I would like to steal the equation from your story. This one here, H equals a half C delta T zero or proper time. So I'll start by just copying that out straight, straight out of the box. So it's H equals a half C delta T zero. So that's just copying and pasting that bit, putting it here so I can concentrate on this part of the story. I would now like to substitute that in for H and that would give me C equals two, just copying it now, square root, a half V T squared, a half V delta T squared plus, instead of putting H I'm going to be putting a half C delta T zero squared, so a half C delta T zero. I hope I'm not writing too small. And all of that is underneath the square root. And then I would be dividing that by delta t as per normal. Now I'm probably going to need uh, a few extra pieces of paper now, but this expression we're now going to whittle down to get something really important. So because I'm going to be using a lot of space I'm going to start a fresh piece of paper and just copy what I currently have because I don't want to lose anyone. Although the maths is straightforward, I don't want you to lose any of the steps. So this is literally me copying and pasting now that equation so I can do some basic math steps. Delta T. And I don't want to skip any steps at all. Okay, so let's have a look at this equation right here. Let's start by taking uh, the delta t over to the other side. So there we have delta t times by delta t. Let's take the 2 over to the other side. So normally I would divide by 2 here, but I'm going to write it as a half. And then I'm going to undo the square root, in which case all of this becomes squared. And then I'm left with this. Okay, so to get from here to here, I've times both sides by delta t, and I've divided both sides by 2, and then I have squared both sides. Uh, next step, I'd like to remove these brackets, in which case we'll end up with c squared delta t squared over 4 equals v squared delta t squared over 4 plus c squared delta t zero squared over four. And here the fours are going to cancel. And the next step I'd like to do is divide everything that I can see by c squared. So this divided by c squared, this divided by c squared, this divided by c squared. That then allows me to cancel that and that and that and that. So, Let's uh, copy this out again, but neaten it up a little bit. So we've got delta t squared is all we're left with on this side. Equals. Now I've got v squared over c squared, so I'm going to write that as v over c all squared. Delta t squared. Plus, and all I'm left with here is delta t zero squared. Okay, so far so good. Next part is I would like to collect up my delta t terms. Now, delta t is my observation of the time interval, uh, 
delta t0 is your observation of the time interval, and this one is proper time, don't forget. So if I take this expression over to the left, I'll get delta t squared minus v over c squared delta t squared equals delta t0 squared. So n nothing, nothing too fancy at this stage. It looks as if I'm going to need a few pieces of paper if I keep uh, putting in all the steps. Next step, let's pull out delta t squared as a common factor. Delta t squared, big brackets, 1 minus v over c squared equals delta t0 squared. Let's get a fresh piece of paper ready to slide up underneath here. Okay, I would now like to take this bit over to the other side and divide it. So I'm going to have now delta t squared equals delta t0 squared over 1 minus v over c squared. Now let's pause and take a look at this equation and see what we can make of it. This equation links my observations of a time interval to your observations of a time interval dependent on the speed of light which is a constant and the velocity of the train. So what happens to this expression if the velocity of the train is reasonably slow? So you'll have a reasonably slow velocity divided by the speed of light and the speed of light is a big number so you'll have really small number divided by really big number to produce really really uh, small number, one subtract a really small number and then we're going to be squaring it again. Okay, so that is not going to make a huge amount of difference to what uh, I'm observing compared to what you're observing. But if we were to make the velocity here instead of it being normal speeds of a train something a little bit faster, and make this fraction here something more substantial, we'll end up with one divided by something substantial, which is a number that is significantly less than one. And when you divide your time observations by a number that is less than one, it will produce a larger time observation for me. So I will always see time intervals that are larger than your time intervals. Your time intervals are proper time intervals. You could possibly argue that they're the smallest time intervals that you can get. Every other time interval is going to be larger by comparison. So let's continue with this derivation by adding a few extra bits. Now, first things first, let's just neaten it up to make, to neaten it up to make delta t the subject. So I'll be uh, square rooting both sides. Uh, I'm not going to skip a single math step if I can help it over. 1 minus v over c squared, which will give us uh, delta t 0 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared. Okay, now let's introduce uh, a few terms. First things first, let's say that uh, we're going to introduce a term known as the speed parameter. It's given the symbol beta, and beta equals the velocity of the train compared to the speed of light. And that means I can write our equation now just copying and pasting this now by putting the substitution in. Delta t equals delta t0 divided by the square root of 1 minus beta now. Uh, beta being the speed parameter. Another symbol that we can introduce is the Lorentz factor, which is given a gamma symbol. And the Lorentz factor is 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus beta. And that means the final version I can write is the time interval that I observe is equal to the time interval that you observe times by the Lorentz factor. The Lorentz factor is obliged to always be greater than the number 1 because the velocity of the train is always required to be less than the speed of light making the speed parameter always less than the number one. Okay, 
and it can never be bigger than the number one. Interesting things are as follows. As the velocity of the train gets uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, the time difference between my observations of uh, the ticking of time and yours becomes equal. They become equal. The Lorentz factor becomes approaches the number one. When the speeds of the train approach that of the speed of light, c divided by c becomes the number one, becomes number one. One subtract one is zero, and anything divided by zero becomes infinity. So, effectively. When the train starts to approach the speed of light, the time that I start to observe becomes infinite, which is why you would uh, come back when your train slows back down again. You'll be in a com have experienced a completely different time to me, and that's that's one of the some science fiction writers like to use that idea as um, as uh, the basis of a science fiction book for time travel. Because if you can accelerate yourself to the speed of light, that means everybody else is observing infinite amount of time for every tick of second that you see. And that means when you slow down from the speed of light, you can effectively choose which point in that duration of time you'd like to come back in. But that's just science fiction. So I'll end on a graph, because we all love graphs. And that's going to be a graph of the speed parameter on the uh, x-axis and the Lorentz factor on the y-axis. And we're going to be interested in the number 1 for the Lorentz and we're going to be interested in the number 1 for our speed parameter. And it's going to be as follows. When the velocity of the train is nice and slow, the speed parameter is next to zero. Under those circumstances, when uh, the speed parameter is zero, the Lorentz factor is one. So it's one subtract zero is one, square root of one is one, one divided by one is one. And it stays one and gets increased, steadily, increasingly bigger a little bit. But when the uh, speed parameter becomes the number one, so c divided by c equals one, one divided by one is zero, the square root of zero is zero, and something divided by zero is infinity, we have an asymptote here as we approach the speed of light. Okay, let's move on to video two where we'll have a look at a couple of examples.